Uh, can I welcome members to the 10th meeting in 2018 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Uh, can we welcome Jill Clark, Neil Moji, is that the right pronunciation? Okay. Thank you. Uh, David Johnson and Julian Swanson to the meeting to give evidence on the Prescription Scotland Bill. Um, before that session starts, there's one piece of business the committee must decide first, and that is a decision on taking business in private. Uh, it's proposed we take items four, five, and six in private. Item four is consideration of the delegated powers provisions in the Management of Offenders Scotland Bill. Item five is a draft report on the Scottish Crown Estate Bill. And item six is an update on the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill. Does the committee agree to take these items in private? Thank you. So we'll move on to item two, which is consideration of the Prescription Scotland Bill. Uh, we've been designated as the lead committee for this bill, so this morning we're beginning our stage one scrutiny. So as I said before, we've got uh, before us today Jill Clark, who's head of Civil Law Reform Unit, and Neil Moji, solicitor from the Scottish Government, and David Johnson, QC, Commissioner, and Gillian Swanson, Project Manager from the Scottish Law Commission. Welcome to you all. And I'll open the evidence session. Um, I'll start with a, a couple of general uh, questions about the sort of consultation uh, that went on here. So uh, perhaps the uh, Scottish Law Commission can just tell us um, what the key features of the consultation were, how you went about it, um, what documents were published, who was consulted, and what the responses were. Uh, yes, thank you very much, convener. Um, the position is we, we carried out what was, uh, we think, a comprehensive consultation exercise. At an early stage, we held a seminar for interested uh, people, at various professionals and uh, business interests, and we used that to formulate the proposals that we then drew together in a discussion paper which was put out for consultation um, for a period of three months. And we, we publicised the discussion paper to about 110 uh, people directly, as well as uh, making news of the consultation available on our website and I think also through Twitter. Um, then we um, subsequently, having received the responses to the consultation, we drew together our report, which as you know, always includes a, a draft bill, and we then carried out a further exercise um, consulting on a working draft of the bill, which we found quite productive. Again, we tried to follow the same pattern of um, publicising it as widely as possible and also drawing it to the specific attention of various stakeholders, including local authorities, central government departments, as well as insurance companies, business interests and professionals. Um, I think um, those are probably the, the key features. And if I've missed something, I'm happy, of course, to expand on that. OK. Well, what would you say were the main points to emerge from the consultation? Um, I think the, the the main topics in which consultees were interested, I would say, were the the scope of the the five year prescription. Uh, because, as as the committee is aware, we were we are proposing that that it be expanded for various reasons, and that that was something which I think particularly engaged the interests of um, central and local government, uh, especially when they saw the working draft of the bill. Um, so that, that would be, I think, the one key issue. So far as business professionals and insurers were concerned, probably the, the key issues related to the so-called discoverability test, that's to say changing the, the time at which in claims for damage that was originally latent, um, the prescriptive period begins to run. Um, and we were recommending changes to that, as the committee knows, as well as to the, the length and the starting point of the 20-year cut-off prescription. Those are things in which those particular people were uh, especially interested. And I think finally, um, the question of the, whether it should be permitted to extend the prescriptive period, and if so, in what circumstances, that again is something that's important in practice for solicitors and professionals, and that's an issue um, on which they certainly uh, express their views um, quite um, fully in, the, in consultation. So I think those would be the main issues. Thank you very much for that. Um, 
from the the government point of view, um, did the did the government carry out a public consultation? Yeah. I I mean, in general, the Scottish Government doesn't consult on um, bills that have been identified as suitable for this process, um, mainly because the SLC has just normally undertaken a very recent comprehensive consultation of their own. Mm. Um, but we do um, carry out some targeted and focused consultation um, with key stakeholders. So in September last year, the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs wrote to a number of representative bodies. Um, they included the Association of British Insurers, the Institute of Chartered Accountants, the Royal Incorporation of Architects, the Law Society, the Faculty, COSLA, um, the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, Construction, sorry, Construction Scotland, and Civil Engineering Contractors Association. And we received two responses. Um, one really just offered their continued assistance with the bill. I think they'd been assisting the Scottish Law Commission with it. The other sought clarification on a couple of technical issues. Um, and we wrote back to them and, and they confirmed that they were content. Was that last one Cosler? Yes, it was. Yeah, OK. Any questions from members on the consultation? Yeah? Um, did, um, did either the SLC or the government... Uh, right to likes of the Citizens Advice Scotland or any other like welfare rights organisation? Uh, we didn't know that Scottish Government. I don't think we did on this occasion. Um, Citizen Rights have informed us recently that they're paring down and um, they normally just pick up it from our Twitter feed if they're interested in responding. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Right, um, so we'll move on. Um, I think Al Alison Harris has a question. Good morning. In England and Wales, debts relating to council tax and business rates arrears are extinguished after six years. So could you explain to me what is the policy rationale and or the legal reasons for allowing councils 20 years to recover such a debt in Scotland? I'll, I'll leave the legal reasons to, to colleagues, but um, the exceptions relating to council tax and the business rates, um, the bill basically maintains the status quo. So um, we can't comment on why the position is different in, in England and Wales, but that difference will have subsisted for, for some time. Um, here, local authorities had made representation to the Scottish Law Commission <coughs> on the matter, and among the points they made were that the policy regions which justify accepting taxes payable to the Crown, um, such as HMRC and Revenue Scotland, for the five-year prescription um, apply equally to taxes payable to local authorities <coughs> and that whilst it was acknowledged that as a rule five years should be sufficient time to collect these taxes and um, there were cases in which local authorities faced difficulty in collecting the taxes when they fell due as well as arrears of tax from previous years. Um, the Scottish Law Commission was persuaded by these arguments and they noted that both kinds of taxes benefit from the same special provisions for enforcement by diligence and by summary warrant procedure and it seemed appropriate um, that their amenability to prescription should be the same. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, just, just to be clear on that, if, um, if somebody's managed to dodge paying council tax for you know more, more than five years uh, down south they could get away with it but not here uh, six years in six England years. And Wales, yes yeah uh, but no not here it's it's 20 years that would apply okay right um, right David so, sorry if you were going to come in there mr. Johnson knows there's um, I think there's there's not very much I can add to to that. Uh, as uh, Jill Clark has just said, the we we weren't initially when we consulted, mm. we weren't much persuaded that special rules needed to be made for council tax. Albeit, as, mm. as she's already explained, the position is that it's generally understood that it's mm. not covered by the five-year prescription, and therefore it applies uh, the, only the twenty-year prescription is available. Um, it is perhaps just worth adding that um, the. The difference between the six years in England and the 20 years here is perhaps a little less stark uh, than it appears, because if, if you get a, a recovery order, a liability order in England within the six-year period, then you can enforce that uh, without any limit of time, essentially. So that 
in practice, the differences in, in the time scale may, may be uh, less stark than, than they appear. But I, th I think the position really is that um, we decided after the representations already described and that, uh, that there were difficulties in recovering arrears that uh, we should not be too dogmatic about saying we weren't persuaded and that we should st uh, sit with the status quo. And that's really where we've ended up. OK, thank you. OK, David. Thank you, Karina. Yeah, and good morning, panel. Um, the combined effect of Section 3 of the Bill and Section 38 of the Social Security Bill is that five-year prescription would apply to devolved benefits, but 20-year prescription to reserve benefit. Why is there a divergence of approach here? Um, well, again, in terms of the Department for Work and Pensions policy in respect of the reserved Social Security payments, <coughs> that's, that's really a matter for them, and we don't feel we can... Um, comment on that. The bill provides maintenance of the status quo for them, so it was um, 20 years before and it's 20 years now. Um, the Social Security Scotland Bill, which is currently before the Scottish Parliament, sets out that obligations to make payments to Scottish ministers for recovery of devolved Social Security payments made in error will prescribe after five years. The effect will be that overpaid Devolved Social Security payments cannot be recovered after five years unless Scottish ministers were misled into making the overpayment. Um, Scottish ministers are of the view that this approach fits better than any longer period of prescription, given the fundamental principle underpinning the Scottish social security system that people should be treated with dignity and respect. Um, and having a five-year prescription may also act as a driver of continuous improvement in the new Social Security Agency, supporting prompt action to establish whether or not to recover um, overpayments. And I think the difference um, between the approaches is probably a natural consequence of having devolved powers here, and um, that the Scottish Government can do things differently based on the priorities set by Scottish ministers. Thank you. Um, more generally, when the proposals were being developed, what consideration was given to a possible interaction between Social Security Scotland Bill and the Prescription Bill? Um, perhaps I could, from the Low Commission perspective, uh, the timing meant that, in, in fact, we did not, while we were formulating our proposals, give consideration to the Social Security Bill. It, it was introduced, as you'll know, in June 2017, and our report was published uh, two to three weeks after that. So, um, in essence, we, we weren't in a position to formulate policy or recommendations taking account of the provisions in that bill. We did, however, um, once uh, the government uh, took our report on board and was considering how best to progress it, we had some discussions with the Scottish government about um, how these would interact um, in the course of uh, August and December of last year. And I, th and I think probably there I have to leave the story for, for Jill Clark to, to take over. And I, I think the, the position is as described that um, for for the Department of Work and Pensions 20 years is what they have and is what they want in, pol in policy terms and in um, our policy terms for the Scottish Government five years was seen as um, more appropriate and therefore there is a divergence. Uh, yeah, no, why, why is it seen as more appropriate? <coughs> um, because I think there, and I'm speaking about a policy area which is not my own, so you'll forgive me if, I'm, if um, I take my time over this, but um, Social Security colleagues would say that they've taken a, a, you know, a different approach with the Social Security Scotland Bill. They've set out you know, principles. Um, having benefits is a human right within that, that bill. Um, dignity and respect is paramount in, in what in the approach that they've taken and um, they consider therefore that five years is a much more appropriate um, prescriptive period. Okay, it's probably not fair to ask you that question, it's no. probably directed at somebody else. Right, David. Um, in Scotland recovery of an overpayment of benefits or tax credits is to be subject to a 20 year prescription. However, England and Wales take a different approach with a distinction between recovery by court action and recovery by a deduction from ongoing payments. Did the Scottish Government or SLC consider, consider whether Scots law should make that distinction? If so, what conclusions were reached? 
Perhaps I'll start. Okay. And uh, so far as the the commission is concerned, this this is not uh, an issue that we we got into. We considered at a, a more of a general level what exceptions we thought should be made to the proposed general rule that statutory obligations to make payments should uh, prescribe after five years. And we, we didn't uh, get into the question what the appropriate procedures for recovery of benefits uh, would be. So I, I think we regarded that as, as being a matter of policy for others and probably strictly outside the, the narrow confines of our project on prescription. Thank you, Camille. Yes, thank you. Right. Stuart, um, Stuart's got a question on forfeiture. Yeah. Thank you, convener. Good morning, uh, panel. Certainly, an earlier version of the proposals had a specific exception to a uh, five-year prescription for forfeiture. And can you explain what forfeiture is and why you are now content that this exception is not necessary? This is really just a technical change to remove um, what was an un unnecessary provision. Um, so proceedings for forfeiture in relation to customs and excise and proceedings for the forfeiture of a ship um, were accepted from the five-year prescription and they'd been included in the, the bill. And that was to align Scots law with the position in England and Wales in the Limitation Act 1980. But further work revealed that these provisions are not necessary. Um, in relation to statutory obligations to pay tax and duties, these proceedings relate to underlying obligations which are covered already by the exception of tax and duties. And so if the underlying obligation to pay tax does not prescribe after five years, then the means to enforce that obligation by proceedings for forfeiture remains open as long as the obligation exists. Um, so they were removed from the bill following discussion with the Scottish Law Commission and with their agreement, and their removal makes no practical difference. Mm. So it's really just a, it's a, a tidy up exercise? Yes, uh -huh. okay. it would do a bit of duplication, really. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, certainly in terms of uh, Section 5 of the Bill, in relation to that section, the SLC's Option 2 um, was uh, going back to the, the law before uh, Morrison, uh, also got a, a reasonable amount of support uh, on uh, during the consultation. And what is the, the policy benefit of adding the, the requirements that the pursuer must uh, know the, the identity of the defender? And uh, you can respond by uh, reference to examples uh, of situations where you think it's important, if you think that would actually be helpful. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think um, at the most straightforward level, it seemed to us that Prescription is about the extinction of obligations once they're enforceable. And so it's hard to say that you actually have an enforceable obligation unless you know who you are to enforce it against. So that, that's a very sort of simple answer. Uh, a slightly more sophisticated answer is that it also seems seem to us fairer that if, if you don't actually know who was responsible for an act or a mission, um, that prescription should not have started running against you. Um, and to take up your invitation to provide an example, I think uh, in many of these um, instances, construction cases provide the best examples, partly because they're complex and there are many parties involved. So if we take, say, the instance of a, when a defect in a building emerges, often there'll be a, an argument about whether the cause of it is inadequacies in the design, which might be down to the architect or possibly the structural engineer, or whether it's inadequacies in the construction itself, which would be the fault of the contractor or perhaps one or more of the subcontractors. Um, and so the, the key difference that it will make here is that you would need to know, if you identify a design problem, is it the architect or is it the structural engineer who's at fault? And similarly with um, construction problems. And if I could just develop the point a little bit further, one, one of the problems, as you'll know, that we identified in the existing law is that in building contracts where something goes wrong, the employers in the contract typically sue everybody, the architect, the engineers, the surveyors, uh, subcontractors, contractors, because they just don't want to miss anyone out in case it turns out that they lose their claim by prescription. And um, we think that that's wasteful of resources for the parties, for insurers, and also for the courts themselves. So the, the difference, the adding the identity criterion, the, the third of the three facts it, in the bill before you, is that uh, employers won't be at risk from prescription until they've actually identified who is at fault. So in my example, 
they've identified it's a design problem and they've identified that it's actually the architect who's responsible for that problem. So the difference there would be without the identity qu uh, query, you would still be faced with potentially having to sue engineers, architects, and anyone else who had some involvement in the design. This should obviate that need. Can, can I ask a supplementary to that then? I mean, I am not an expert in, uh, in contract law and in building, but if to, to use your example uh, in terms of our of our uh, uh, construction, um, if it still wasn't clear as to what the defect actually was, and clearly, uh, you'd imagine that uh, all the parties would uh, would state it wasn't them; uh, it's not their responsibility. Yeah. So if you don't understand, or if you don't know um, which person actually has been the person who has been responsible, or the or the company has been responsible, then how would this aspect then work in this bill? I think would it then just go back to what they did beforehand, just the, the uh, it, and have litigation against everyone? Well, I, I suppose that's one possibility. Here, the, what, what we've been seeking to do is to, to make sure the time doesn't start too early, because as I, as I said, if it starts too early, then you're forced, uh, in a situation where you don't really know enough, you're forced to, to sue everybody just to protect the position. Um, obviously, if, if, if because we now have a, a, tr a proposed tripart test in the, in the bill before you, where you need to know, firstly, that you've suffered some loss, that's usually easy once there's an evident defect in the building. Um, the difficulty then is saying, well, was it caused by somebody's act or omission? Did someone either do or fail to do something that uh, they should have been done? Um, but I, I think the short answer to your question is if, if they simply haven't been able to pinpoint what the problem is, then on this test, the time wouldn't be running yet against the, the pursuer. So their claim would, would still be alive and not subject to being cut off by prescription. Okay. So it, was, it would remain alive until such times that they, that they managed to identify yes. one or m multiple uh, Exactly. They, okay. for, for each relevant person, each party they might sue, they need to, you need to be able to tick all three boxes mm -hmm. about defect, act or omission and identity. Once you've done that, the time will start to run. Okay. Uh, you've got five years from then in relation to each of those people. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, sure. um, so just just to simplify it, if I've if I've bought a new house and problem problems emerge with this house, I'm basing this on a an actual case that that, that I dealt with. Problems um, emerge with the foundations, say. So you would you would think, right? Well, I'm going to make a claim against the people who built the house. The people who built the house may then make a claim against the people who put the foundations in. The people who put the foundations in may make a claim against the person who designed the foundations. And so it goes on. I, as the householder, cannot possibly go all, all that way down the chain. So what, what am I to do? I, th I think in practice, um what you would do, I mean, obviously there are difficulties for people who are unable to get professional advice, and that's something we just have to live with in uh, creating the, the legal system. But um, I think the, what one would do is go to an expert, ask for an expert report, what is, what is the problem here, how was it caused, and who is at fault? And if, if you get good quality expert advice, then that would say it's actually the, pe the person who designed the foundation or the person who inadequately poured the concrete that... Uh, is is at fault, and so then yeah. you would be starting to accumulate the knowledge that you need for a prescription to start to begin. But I've never had a contract with those people. I bought the house off the builder, so surely my claim is against the builder. And if if there's another claim, that's up that's up to them to pursue it. Uh, yes, I would. Yes, clearly, if if the claim's in contract, then you you have to rely on the person you contracted with. Yes. Okay. So the clock would start ticking as soon as I take action against the builder? In, I, I, yes, I, I, think, I think that must be right. And if, if you were able, for example, to find a, a claim in Delict to bring against somebody else, not totally straightforward on the current state of the law, but if you were able to, 
then the question when time started to run against that claim would have to be addressed by looking at the same three factors that we've been discussing. And that wouldn't necessarily begin at the, the same date as the contractual claim. But uh, the, ba the basic position, is, uh, as, as you say, is, is, is that if you have a contract, then that should be the first um, recourse that you seek. And if you were simply seeking, for example, making good of <coughs> defects in the building, mm -hmm. then we may not be in the territory of damages, uh, a, a damages claim at all. <coughs> yeah. But all these things will be quite sensitive to the particular facts of each case. Okay. Yes. Can I just to, to take that on a bit further? Um, uh, so you'd mentioned subcontractors in yes. your opening uh, other comments, and uh, clearly the the economy uh, has been um, it's not been totally solid over the course of the last ten years, and particularly in the house building sector, and many house builders uh, will have brought in and still do bring in subcontractors now. Some uh, if there was a, a problem in the house, and ultimately it was down to the work of a subcontractor. But that uh, subcontractor has now been out of business. Um, who would, uh, would the uh, would the claim uh, go towards the house builder, and for them to then attempt to try to recover money? But who would they recover it from uh, to try to get the thing fixed? Yeah. Uh, but also, what, what then happens to the person who has purchased the house? I think um, for each of those cases, for if you were, say, working on a particular case in practice, the first thing you would want to do is look closely at the contract, of what remedies it makes available to the contracting party who has been let down. Um, I think typically in a case like that, you would expect that the remedy would be against the, um, the seller of the house, who may be a property developer or, or maybe a building contractor. That, that's where I would imagine most contracts would make the, the liability lie, but it's difficult to give a general answer because it will depend entirely on the, on the contractual situation. And typically one may find in contracts like this that you are not given any uh, contractual entitlement to go and pursue other parties. Your only remedy is to pursue the one with whom you entered into the contract. But I, I'm not sure I can give you a, any more specific answer because it will depend very much on the content of each contract. Okay. Did, did you have a question, Nelson? No, I'm just listening with interest. That was, I think you answered that slightly. Okay. Right. Okay. okay. Um, my, my final uh, question at the moment is uh, for Section 8 of the Bill, um, some respondents to the discussion paper uh, expressed a doubt that the proposed rule would work well uh, in relation to the defenders' emissions or ongoing breaches as compared to uh, how it would work for the defenders' actions. Uh, can the Scottish Government offer uh, the committee any reassurances here on this particular topic? Um, good to leave to David to answer that one on the, the, the new start date. What? Uh, Section 8. Section 8. Uh, Yes, I, the, the Commission uh, obviously considered the, the submissions that were made about uh, the difficulty in applying the proposed new rule to emissions. And we uh, were not persuaded that actually it introduced anything that wasn't already an issue under the existing system. Because as, as you may uh, recall, under the existing legislation, um, um, damages claims are already measured by, um, well, there's already reference to continuing acts or omissions in the legislation. And therefore, even under our current system, you have to be able in certain cases to identify when an omission took place. Typically, you can say it took place when it becomes impossible for, for it to be remedied. So you have to do something by a certain date or it becomes impossible to do. That would often be the date you would identify as the date that an omission be occurred as a matter of law. But I think that the short answer really is that um, this is an issue under the current law, and we were not persuaded that referring to acts or emissions in Section 8 was going to introduce a problem that uh, lawyers are not already used to uh, dealing with uh, under the existing legislation. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so we'll move on to um, Section 6, which deals with interruptions and extensions to 20-year... Uh, prescription. 
Um, so it, it would amend the law so the main type of 20-year prescription could no longer be interrupted and halted by a relevant claim or a relevant acknowledgement, uh, but there would be the possibility of an extension to 20-year prescription. This would um, only uh, be to allow a litigation which has started to finish. These proposals got majority support on consultation. Brodie's, though, was one of a minority of respondents uh, who expressed reservations about Section 6. Uh, it suggested the period should still be able to be interrupted. However, it should restart, not from the beginning, but from where it left off in the first place. Um, do you want to comment on that suggestion? Um, yes, thank you. I think the first thing I'd say is that we, we have common ground with Brodie's in thinking that there is an issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, there's, it's simply a question what the best mechanism of doing that is. And uh, as your introduction is, uh, to the question has already explained, this is our, the single exception that we propose introducing to uh, having an absolute cut-off after 20 years. The rationale for that is that prescription is meant to cut off old or stale claims, but that clearly is not a rationale that applies if somebody is actively pursuing a claim when the 20-year period is, uh, cut-off um, arrives. So, um, in common with Brodie's, we regarded this as an issue that needed to be addressed. And we gave some thought when they proposed that we might do it differently from uh, the way we've suggested, which is simply tacking on a bit to the end of the 20-year period. We gave some thought to that, but we, we thought our own solution was actually preferable. If you take, um, if you take Brodie's uh, suggestion, you, you could end up, say, with a, a litigation raised in the middle of the 20-year period which took five years to conclude. And on the Brodie's analysis, you would then, in effect, have a 25-year prescriptive period. Now, that's certainly one way of doing it. Uh, our, on our approach, though, we thought uh, it preferable to extend the period simply by whatever balance of time is needed to complete the proceedings which are in play at the end of the 20 years. And we are hopeful that, in the rare cases where this arises, that balance of time would really be quite short. We're relying partly on the fact that nowadays courts tend to case manage cases and they don't allow them to drag on indefinitely. So it seemed to us that, that uh, on the whole, um, in order to keep as close to the 20-year limit as possible, that our um, solution would be preferable to Brodie's, although they aim to achieve the same thing. And I think the, the final point I'd make is that when Brodie's consult, uh, responded to our consultation on the draft, Bill, um, they expressed the view that they were content with the scheme that, that we'd put forward there. So um, I, I think um, they are, in fact, satisfied with, with the provision in the bill as it stands before you. Right. OK, thanks for that. Um, section 13, standstill agreements. Alison's got a question on that. When the SLC, in its discussion paper, proposed the possibility of contracting out of prescription, they got a mixed response. So is the Scottish Government content that the conditions now set out in Section 13 of the Bill will remove any controversy and make it a suitable proposal for this committee to be considering? Uh, yes, we absolutely do think that, but I mean, David can perhaps explain the rationale behind it. But Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to do that and then uh, return to you if, 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 if that would help. Um, I suppose if I could just give the, 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 the background thinking quite briefly. The, the starting point is that the Act lays down the prescriptive periods and therefore we think those ought in general to be the periods that actually apply. So that's one sort of premise. A second one is that if you're going to allow any extension to those periods, it, then those extensions must be ones which balance the interests of parties, which obviously diverge. And it mustn't be capable of undermining the, the system as a whole. So that led us to the view that um, it should not be possible to extend the 20-year period, with the single exception that we've already discussed about proceedings that were continuing, because it's meant to be an absolute cut-off. And therefore, to allow people to extend the 20-year period would clearly uh, undermine that principle. So we then focused our attention on the shorter periods, like the five-year period. Should it be possible for parties to, to change that? And I think a key factor for us was that we thought it would be 
inappropriate for parties to be able to change the prescriptive period in advance, for, for example, while making a contract. Because we were concerned, for example, if, if parties were to enter into a contract that says we, we are going to have a 10-year prescriptive period instead of a five-year one, that would, well, firstly undermine the system, which is supposed to be as clear and to have as few different periods as possible. And secondly, it would favour the party who is in the stronger bargaining position. Um, so that's what led us to the view that the right balance is struck if you permit some agreements to extend the, the period, but only in strictly limited circumstances. And the ones we proposed were, firstly, as I've just been saying, that there must be a dispute. Uh, the dispute must have arisen already. So you don't, you don't invent a new prescriptive period in advance. You uh, enter into this agreement after the dispute has arisen. And we also proposed that the agreements should be limited in time and should be uh, capable of being made only once. Perhaps I could go back to the construction example for a moment in case that helps. If, if we have, say, the employers in a building contract who learn all the relevant facts just before the five years are um, about, to, well, they've learned all the facts, so they, they know they've suffered a damage, they know it was a, the architect who did it because it was a design problem, they then have five years. Under the existing system, the only way to pre preserve their claim is to raise proceedings um, and what the bill provision is seeking to do is to give them another option. If they can agree before the five years have run out, agree with the architect, we'll have a short extension for say six months or a year to see if we can settle out of court. We thought that was a more efficient use of resources. It also avoids raising the stakes or increasing the pressure in the way that litigation does and it uh, saves costs as well. So it seemed to us that was an a an appropriate way of uh, dealing with this issue and struck the right balance. And I think the other point to make uh, addressing your question um, is that although there was some divergence of view about whether these agreements were a good thing, a lot of it was really predicated on the particular conditions that applied. So we, th we think by introducing the three conditions I've mentioned after the event, only one year and only one extension, we think that those conditions actually, in, in fact, address most of the reservations that were expressed by, by consultees, or I should say all of the reservations, I, I believe, that were expressed by consultees. So I, I hope that may help. Thank you. That does. Thank you. Okay. Um, right. So we're going to uh, ask about uh, a very interesting case. That's the Hugh Patterson case. Um, Stuart will ask about this. I wonder, wonder, Stuart, if you could just for the record, give a little bit of background to it, which is in our papers. Sure. Um, certainly. Uh, Mr. Patterson's uh, case, there's a petition in the Parliament, a uh, petition number PE01672, and uh, it was submitted in October uh, 2017. Um, he submitted this petition uh, because he had uh, particular experience of the effect of the 20-year the prescription. Uh, this was when the, the conveyancing associated with the house purchase went wrong, uh, something he didn't find out about until many years later. He then tried to sue his solicitor for damages. What Mr Patterson found is that the, the legal obligation uh, to pay damages uh, can be extinguished by the 20-year prescription, uh, without the five-year prescription period even starting uh, to run, and uh, without the pursuer having been aware that the legal obligation to pay him uh, or her damages existed at all. So certainly I know that the SLC acknowledged that Mr Patterson's case was a very difficult one, uh, where the prescription had operated harshly. However, it also said that the policy needed, uh, were needed for the law uh, to be certain meant that uh, no proposals to help people in Mr Patterson's position uh, could be included in the bill. Uh, the Scottish Government supports the SLC's position on this, and the latest correspondence uh, from Mr Patterson to the Public Petitions Committee suggests that uh, he now thinks uh, that uh, reform to land registration law uh, and practice might be the appropriate avenue uh, for reform. Now, the committee certainly is aware of Mr Patterson's petition and relating to his particular experience of the 20-year prescription and for, for the benefit of the record is the solution to the problem that he outlines uh, the reform of the law in prescription uh, and if not, can the Scottish Government indicate where it thinks the solution might actually be. 
Um, I mean, we would note that Mr Patterson understands that the reasoning behind the law and prescription, um, or he understands the law of prescription and that liability cannot be carried in perpetuity. And the Scottish Government's view is that the 20-year long stop serves the important purpose of creating legal certainty, finality and, and fairness. Um, we were asked by the Petitions Committee for our view on an approach which was suggested at one of their, their meetings um, of notifying purchasers of the title at the time of registration. And we had commented that there is relevant legislation in place under Section 40 of the Land Registration Etc. Scotland Act 2012 that when an application for registration is accepted or rejected by the keeper of the registers, um, they have to notify the applicant. Um, and in most cases, that's usually the solicitor acting for the party involved in the property transaction, um, so long as it's reasonably practical to carry out the notification. And that person submitting the application for registration, again, usually the solicitor, um, can specify on the application um, two email addresses to which the notification should be sent. Um, and a further two email addresses may be provided for notification to the grantor of any deed and or their solicitor. Um, so what we're currently going to do is check with the Law Society um, what solicitors do in practice about notifications, because hopefully there is a solution, a kind of administrative solution around this um, that, would, that would remedy the, the difficulty that Mr Patterson had uh, that doesn't disturb the law of prescription. Uh, but clearly, Mr Patterson's case started uh, some years ago before the Land Registration 2012 Act. Yes. Uh, so, um, uh, not, notwithstanding what's in uh, that particular Act, and I, I sat in the committee going through that particular piece of legislation, and it was very much uh, welcome to update uh, that area uh, of law. Uh, but, but certainly Mr Patterson's case obviously predates that particular legislation. Um, and I think we could all accept that uh, this would uh, certainly consider to be a, a hard, a hard case. Uh, but clearly, uh, there has something has happened um, that has had a, a negative effect upon uh, upon Mr. Patterson. So, uh, in terms of some type of remedy, uh, some type of um, su kind of successful outcome um, for Mr. Patterson. Surely, that there has to be some other way of using either um, whether it's this legislation or this bill or some other um, piece of uh, legislation or some other. Well, you touched upon a moment ago in terms of a, a, an admin um, aspect, but there has to be some way to actually try to prevent this type of thing happening again in the future. I think we can prevent it or try and look at remedies that will prevent it. I don't think anything can be done now for. You know, Mr. Patterson's position, unfortunately. So, for Mr. Patterson, you don't think there's any, any, any closure, his, his uh, any has, successful closure for him? Yeah. Well, his claim has prescribed, as far as I'm aware. So, um, there wouldn't be a remedy in in that aspect of of the law. I think his, the solicitor firm is no longer um, functioning. I think they went. Bus, so. So I'd imagine the the, yeah. the the Scottish Law Commission. Um, I'd imagine they'll be. Uh, sorry, the the what do you call? I'm glancy. Uh, law Society. Yes, yes. Sorry. Uh, I'd imagine the Law Society would be uh, very much involved in this particular case. I, I don't know okay. if that is the case. No. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Any further questions from members? Okay. Um, well, uh, a brief session, but we're, we're at the only at the start uh, of our um, look at this. Um, so thank you for your time, and I'll suspend the meeting briefly.
Okay, um, move on to agenda item three, uh, consideration of an instrument subject to the uh, negative procedure, National Health Service, General Medical Services Contracts and Primary Medical Services Section 17C Agreements, Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018, SSI 2018-94. The regulations make various corrections to rectify errors uh, which the committee reported on its 10th report published on the 6th of March. The regulations were laid before the Parliament on the 14th of March and come into force on the 1st of April. This does not respect the requirement that at least 28 days should elapse between the laying of an instrument which is subject to the negative procedure and the coming into force of that instrument. Uh, that's called the 28-day rule. The Scottish Government has explained in correspondence that the rule has been breached so that the various corrections could come into force uh, timelessly on the 1st of April. So does the committee wish to draw the regulations to the attention of the Parliament on reporting ground J as they fail to comply with the requirements of section 28.2 of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010? Okay. Does the committee find the failure to comply with section 28 acceptable in the circumstances as outlined in correspondence received from the Scottish Government to the presiding officer of the 14th of March 2018. Okay. I'll now move the meeting into private session. <laughs>